This evening, open your Bibles back, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter number 2. 2 Chronicles chapter number 2, and I'm going to just read that same one verse that I read this morning. And again, I truly hope this evening that you've prayed for me, that you've lifted me up, that God will touch me and, and allow me to say what he'd have said. Again, I know this is a simple message, but once in a while we got to get back to the basics and realize Folks, you and I as children of God, once we're saved by the grace of God, once we're born into the family of God, there's some things that you and I need to be doing. So this evening, again, just one verse of Scripture, and that's 2 Chronicles chapter 2, and that's verse number 1. And the Bible says, And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for for his kingdom. Father, as we come to you one more time, we thank you for the day and for the blessings and mercies. We thank you, Father, for the privilege to be able to come and meet together like this this evening. We thank you, Father, most of all for salvation. Father, I thank you for Jesus and the blood that was shed. And God, I beg you to forgive me where I've let you down, where I've failed you, where I've come short. Father, this evening I need your help, I need your touch, I need your guidance. I ask you, Father, just to pour out that fresh anointing from on high. I ask you, Lord, just to help me to say and do exactly what you'd have me to. Go with us now through the rest of this service. Father, be with each heart and each life that's listening and watching. And have your way, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said this morning, Solomon getting ready to build this house. He's getting ready to build the temple. And again, not trying to take it out of context, but you and I this evening, we need to build our life up as a house for the name of the Lord. As I said, you know, we're made out of dirt. God formed us out of the dust of the earth. We are earthen vessels. We're nothing but jars of clay these earthly tabernacles. But we need to, because we were created in the image and likeness of God, you and I this evening ought to be built up as a house for the name of our God. We ought to be built up as a house to honor, to glorify, and to magnify our God. Now, as I said this morning, that first step is to accept on faith that finished work at Calvary. Accept on faith what Jesus Christ has done for us. I'm thankful this evening that he went to that cross. I'm thankful that he was that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I'm thankful that even Pontius Pilate could find no fault in him. I'm thankful he was that lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and he still is. People can still get saved today, but we've got to accept him on faith. God's grace is sufficient, and there's enough grace shed to save every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever been born. But you and I have to act on that grace with our faith. We have to accept what Jesus Christ has done for us. Put our trust in Him, not just a matter of believing that Jesus existed. That's a historical fact. As James said, you believe there's one God, you do it well. But the devils also believe and tremble. It's more than just believing that he exists. It's more than just believe that he lived. Thank God he's still alive tonight. He came out of that tomb victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And tonight he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I, just waiting for the Father to send him back to get his church and take us home. But once we have accepted on faith, once we have believed in faith, once we have been born into the family of God, there's a couple of things that you and I need to do. If we're going to have that house built for the name of the Lord, first thing is believe in faith that Jesus Christ has come to save sinners of whom I'm chief. 
But the next thing we need to do, once we've accepted by faith, then you and I need to be faithful in worship. Now, let me tell you just right now, very plainly, I, I, and I'll, I'll get down to Hebrews 9.25 probably in a few minutes. But folks, tonight, and I understand why we can't meet together in the house of God. But you know what God's given us? God's given us technology. And everybody that's a part of Isom Baptist Church can either watch tonight uh, on Facebook or they can listen in on the telephone. Every member of Isom Baptist Church has an opportunity. What they're doing with that opportunity is up to them. The, whether they listen or not, whether they watch or not, that's their choice. And that's a decision they're going to have to make. When Jesus was talking to that woman at the well in John chapter 4, he says, For the hour cometh and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now listen, this is more, and he's trying to tell her because she said, you know, y'all say we're supposed to be in Jerusalem. Our fathers say we're supposed to be up here in the mountains. He said it's not about where, it's about how. Folks, tonight when we go to worship the Lord, it's not about ritual, and it's not about ceremony, and it's not about habit. It's worshiping Him in spirit and truth because we have a desire to truly worship Him. See, it's not a matter of, well, it's, it's church time, so I better go to church. Well, it's time for a song, I'll get a book. It's time to pray, so I'll bow my head. It's time for the offering, so I'll put some money in the plate. It's time for the preaching, so every once in a while I'll nod my head and maybe say amen, and then when the service is over, I'll bow my head and then we'll walk out the door. No, it's more than just going through the motions. We're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. See, my spirit should bear witness with the Spirit of God. If that spirit indwells within me, then I ought to, number one, have a desire to want to be in the house of God. I ought to have a desire to want to worship Him because He truly is worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. Folks, nobody's ever done for me, nobody's ever done for you what Jesus Christ has. And because of what He's done for us, we ought to realize tonight that we owe Him something we can never repay. All I can do is thank Him. All I can do is bow before Him. All I can do is worship Him. All I can do is give Him praise and give Him honor. And that's what building that house for the name of the Lord is all about. And that's worshiping Him. And if I'm a saved child of God and I want to have that house built for the name of the Lord then I ought to be willing to worship him in spirit and in truth not just going through the motions and not for my own good either because I'm going to throw you this just a second the Bible teaches us that it is not supposed to be about just ceremony that's just like if you were you decide okay I'm going to be baptized and I'm going to join the church well, let me tell you something. Water baptism is something that I truly believe once you're saved, you ought to follow the example that Jesus set because water baptism is showing the world that you have died out to yourself and you've been raised up in newness of life. But water baptism ain't going to save you. And if the only reason that you're going to go through that motion and you're going to go down to the river or you're going into a baptistry or you're going to a fish pond for that matter because I've had a baptizing there and if you're just going to go through that motion <coughs> of going through that baptismal act folks you're going to come out a wet sinner and still die and go to hell if that's all you're doing is just doing it out of ceremony well I think I'll get baptized so I can go to heaven no water baptism if your heart's not right with God and you're not worshiping him in spirit and in truth and you understand me, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, we don't have the Spirit, we're none of His. And the Bible says in John chapter 14 that He is truth. So we've got to have Him, we've got to have that Spirit, or we're not going to be able to worship as we're going to worship. So we can join the church, and we can be baptized, and we can shake the preacher's hand. 
But folks, let me tell you something. Getting that name on that church book's not going to do it because that's not doing it in spirit and truth. We've got to get our name written in that Lamb's Book of Life that the Bible tells us about in Revelation chapter number 20. And there's a lot of people today, listen to me, they're going through the motion and they think worship is just putting on a good show and, and, and being there and trying to do the things to impress somebody else. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 18 about two men that went up to the temple to pray. You've heard this. You know this account just as good as I do. The Bible says that the Pharisees stood and said, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, that I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, and I'm sure not like this Pharisee or this publican is down here. He said, I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. I'm going to tell you something right now. That ain't worship either. You can stand all you want to, and you can brag on yourself, you can brag on somebody else. I could stand and say, well, I did this and I did that and I did something else. But folks, that ain't worship. Worship is what God's done for us and telling the lost and dying world that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because thank God it, without Jesus Christ, I'd still be headed for hell. It ain't going to matter how much I fast. It ain't going to matter how much I tithe. I may not be an adulterer. I may not be an extortioner. I may not be unjust in the world world's eyes. But if I don't have Jesus Christ, I'm still unjust in God's eyes. So be, doing like this man did, that's not, that's not worship a bit more than nothing. Let me tell you something. What true worship was, was when that publican wouldn't even look up toward heaven, but he bowed his face toward the ground and said, God be merciful to me a sinner. Now that's true worship from the heart. Because he realized today, he, you know, that, that publican there in the temple that day was just like that thief that was on the right hand of Jesus that day at Calvary when he said Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. There was nothing that that thief could do for Jesus. There was nothing. He was getting ready to die. He was on that cross at Calvary right beside of Jesus. There was nothing that he could do for him, but he knew that Jesus could do it all for him. And folks, that's what worship is. When we realize that Jesus has done it all, that Jesus has paid it all, and all to him we owe. If we want to build that house for the name of the Lord, then once we've accepted him on faith, then we need to be faithful in our worship. We need to be faithful in true worship, not ceremony or habit. And we need to be faithful in true worship. And that's from the heart, not just the mouth, not just the head, not trying to put on a show. But I'm going to say this right now. It also includes public worship. And you can say whatever you want to say. But Hebrews chapter 9 verse 25 is still in the book, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that day approaching. We ought to have public worship. When it's time to be in the house of God, we ought to be in the house of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's bothered me today. It bothered me Wednesday night, and it's going to keep bothering me till we get back in the house of God. There are people that have driven up and down Tuttle Road today. And this morning at 10 o'clock, they realized somebody, don't tell me somebody didn't drive by that church and realize there was no cars in the parking lot. Don't tell me at 11 o'clock that they drove by and realized there was no cars in the parking lot. Then at 6 o'clock this evening, they realized there was no cars in the parking lot. But I'll tell you something that ought to bother the rest of us and make us think. That they drove by my house at 6 o'clock this evening and saw my car was still in my driveway. Mm -hmm. They may not know what's going on. They may not know that, that a whole lot of the people at the church has got COVID. They may not know that we're doing this just to be safe. But folks, they're going to realize something ain't right somewhere. That preacher ain't in the house of God, and it's time for him to be there. That church is empty, and people ought to be there. There ain't no lights on. There ain't no cars in the parking lot. 
And folks, the thing that gets me is I wonder how many members of our Baptist Church does that really bother? It ought to bother every one of us. Amen. It ought to bother every one of us. If I'm building a house up to the name of the Lord and, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel and people... People see me live and they, they watch me and they hear me and, and they know where I go or where I don't go and what I do and what I don't do. If I'm trying to live for God, living for God includes being at the house of God. Amen. And we can say anything we want to. Well, preacher, going to church, don't, don't make me a Christian. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Laying out of church makes you an out of God's will, Christian. Amen. You're not going to be in. You're not going to be in the will of God and lay out of God's house when it's time. Now I ain't talking about people that sick, and I ain't talking about people that can't. I'm talking about people that won't. But this bothers me tonight. It bothered me this morning. It bothered me Wednesday night, and it'll bother me this coming Wednesday night because we ain't going back yet. We're going to make sure everybody's over this before we get back because I don't want to stir it up again and have another round. But folks, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together. And right now, through technology, maybe we can come together, but that still ain't the same as being in each other's presence. That ain't the same as fellowshipping with one another. That ain't the same as being, see, where you're at, you can look into my eye, but I can't look into yours. I can't see you. I don't know how you know what you're really what you're facing and what you're going through we need that fellowship we need that contact we need to meet together like the early church did and be in one mind and one accord so if we're going to build that house up to the name of the lord then once we've accepted on faith jesus christ is our savior then we need to be faithful in our worship and we need to do it without ritual and without ceremony and without habit, we need to do it from the heart. We don't need to do it just out of our mouth and putting on a show. And we need to do it publicly. We need to do it publicly. So once we're saved by faith and once we're faithful in our worship, we need to do something else. And I'm going to finish with this right here. We need to be faithful in our living. Listen to me. Being a child of God is more than just going to the house of God. Being a child of God is more than just being a Sunday morning Christian. Being a child of God is more than just being a Christian when we're inside the walls of the church. It's more than just acting Christ-like when we're around people that we go to church with. We ought to have that life. It, it ought to be that that. Christian lifestyle, I don't know that I like the word lifestyle, but our, our Christian walk, when we walk out the doors of the church, folks, we ought to have that same walk until we walk back in the next time the doors are open. Now the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, and how many times have you heard this? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. That does not mean that we're just putting on a show. But that means that once we're saved by the grace of God, people ought to look at us and say, look how they're living. They didn't used to do things like that. They didn't used to go places like that. They used to, wasn't all that concerned about being in the house of God. Well, they don't go to the bar on Saturday night anymore. They don't go down to the dance hall. They don't do this and they don't do that. They don't talk like they used to talk. But there's something different about them. And the only way that they could do that would be to do it with a touch from God. So that's what you and I ought to be. We ought to be faithful in our living for God if we're going to build up a house unto the name of the Lord. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new again. Once we're saved by the grace of God, there ought to be a new life. We ought to be faithful in our living. We ought to know that there's something different. Now, does that mean we're going to walk perfect? No, we're not going to be perfect. But we ought to be striving for perfection. 
We ought to be striving to live different than we used to. And I'm going to tell you something, because we're saved and we've got that Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be something different in our life. There's going to be something different in our walk, something different in our talk, something different in the way places that we go and, and what we do. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And because that Holy Spirit's there, and Jesus said that when if he went away, the Comforter had come and would guide us into all things. See, we've got that Holy Spirit that will guide us in the things that we're supposed to do. Now, what do we do when we mess up? Things that we used to do that didn't bother us a bit, when we mess up now, they upset us. They embarrass us. They make us sit back and say, wait a minute, I ain't supposed to do like that anymore. I'm not supposed to live like that anymore. So once we're saved by the grace of God, not only should we be faithful in our worship, we should be faithful in our living because we've got a, the Spirit of God that dwells within us that's helping us walk differently than the way that we used to walk. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We need to think about the things we do. We need to think about the things. Is what I'm going to do, is what I'm planning on doing tomorrow, is it going to bring a shame and reproach or is it going to glorify God? Is something I'm getting ready to say, is it going to glorify God or is it going to bring a shame and reproach upon God? See, the things we do, we need to do to glorify God, to lift Him up, to magnify Him. See, as we building up that house to the name of our Lord, see, told you this morning, got to start on that foundation. We've got Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. But you remember what the book of Isaiah says? He says when we, we, we get into this word, and we want to know how to live. We take line upon line and precept upon precept. Well, that's the same way you when you build in a house. When you start laying brick, you start laying block, you go that line. And then you put the one on top. And you just keep building and keep building. Folks, let me tell you something. That's what happens when we grow. That's what happens when we mature. See, we do these things for the glory of God. We're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And as our life begins to mature, then we continue to build that house for our God. And it gets bigger and bigger, and we continue to grow for His honor and glory. Even the Apostle Paul said, I've not arrived yet. I count not myself to have apprehended I've not arrived yet. That's why I'm still building and I'm still working with the help of the Lord to do what He'd have us to do. But in Romans chapter 12, He tells us very plainly. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this present world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, I beseech you. He said, I'm not commanding you, I'm begging you. And he's talking to God's people because he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, why is he begging the church? By the mercies of God. Because what God's done for you and I, then you and I ought to be living faithfully. We ought to be living obedient lives. We ought to be living that new life in Christ Jesus. And so we're to present our bodies that living sacrifice. When the flesh wants to do something and the Spirit leads us to do something else, then we're to die out to self. We're to die out to flesh. The Bible says we're to mortify these members. We're to put them to death. See, you and I today... Jesus did for us what nobody else could do. Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And what you and I need to do today is get our flesh out of the way. We need to get it out of the way and do what thus saith the Lord. You remember what Jesus told the disciples? They couldn't even listen to me. Now think on this. They couldn't pray with him one hour. But right after he rose from the dead, they went fishing all night. Now think on that one. 
But he went and told them, he said, couldn't you watch and pray an hour? He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So that's why you and I have to crucify this flesh and do what the Spirit would have us to do. So Paul said, I'm begging you by the mercies of Christ, by what Christ has done for us, what God has done for us, that we ought to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy. And that's H-O-L-Y, holy and acceptable unto God. The things that I do in my life ought to be pleasing to Him. The things I'm doing in my life ought to be acceptable unto him and that's just our reasonable service that's not anything out of the ordinary that's not anything grand and glorious on our part it's just ordinary reasonable service and the way we're going to do that is be not conformed to this present world i'm not going to live a life pleasing to god if i'm conformed to this world now i know i mentioned this wednesday night but over in 1 John, he still tells us, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And he's not talking about don't love people. He's talking about don't love the characteristics of the world. Don't love the greed. Don't love the hatred. Don't love the, the, the lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The things, go back to, to Galatians and, and look at the, the, the fruits of the Spirit, but also the works of the flesh. And we, you and I don't have any business living according to the works of the flesh. And that's what he's saying. Be not conformed to this present world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And once we are renewed, once we're saved, once we've been transformed, then we are that new creature in Christ Jesus. And instead of living after the works of the flesh, we can live according to the fruit of the Spirit. But let me finish with this right here. The Apostle Paul's writing in Galatians chapter 1. You and I, we want to talk about we're saved by the grace of God. And I know one of the, one of the, the a popular phrase it used to be is, you know, I, I'm not what I ought to be, but I, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. And if you're saved by the grace of God, that ought to be true. If you're saved, Saved by the grace of God, you shouldn't be what you used to be. I should, excuse me, be what I used to be. I ought to be that new creature. I ought to be doing the things that God would have me to do. I ought to be letting my light shine. I ought to be living that, have, presenting my body as that living sacrifice. But Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, But they heard that he which persecuted us in times past, now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. One of the greatest things that people could ever say about me and you once we're saved is, you know what? That old boy don't live like he used to. Or that girl don't live like she used to. There has been a change that I could have never imagined there's been a change that nobody could ever have foreseen. And that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said the, the, the faith, he's now preaching the faith that once he tried to destroy. But you know what ver the next verse says? It says that they glorified God in me. Paul said they didn't glorify me. They glorified God in me. See, they knew it was God that made the change. You and I tonight, we cannot turn over a new leaf. We can't change ourselves for the better. Oh, there might be this we can quit, and that we can quit. But without Jesus Christ, we are still unrighteous in the sight of God. Without Jesus Christ, we're still in our sin. Without Jesus Christ, we're still stinking and filthy. But once we're saved by the grace of God, listen to me, and Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord. Once I've been saved by the grace of God, I need to determine some things. I need to determine that I'm going to be faithful in my worship. Once I'm saved by the grace of God, I need to not be ashamed 
to be in the house of God. I need to determine and purpose in my heart that when the doors are open, if I can be there, I'm going to be there. Once I'm saved by the grace of God and I've begun to build this house under the Lord, I need to determine that I'm going to live the way God would have me to live. It's not going to matter what family says. It's not going to matter what friends say. It's not going to matter what co-workers say. But that somebody can say, you know what? There was a time I never thought they would be living like this. And Paul said, and they glorified <coughs> God in me. Folks, we realize tonight, it's not us that's made the change. It ain't the church that's made the change. The change that's been made in our lives has been made by a holy and a righteous God. Amen. That's our only hope tonight. So, first things first, do you know you're saved? If you don't, the Bible still says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're saved, then you need to be faithful in worship, and that includes public worship. That means we ought to come together unless we're providentially hindered, unless there's something wrong, something going on. And let me tell you something, folks. You know, two sneezes in the car, that, that ain't reason to stay home. Stumping your toe when you get ready to go to church Sunday morning ain't no reason to stay home. You say, preacher, you don't know what's going on. No, I might not know what's going on. But your wife burning the biscuits and y'all getting in an argument ain't no reason to stay home. Matter of fact, that's more of a reason to get to the house of God so that you and your wife can make up with the help of the Lord. Because except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So as I'm trying to build my house to the name of the Lord, I need to worship, and then I need to live the way God would have me to live. So this evening, if you've been slack on worship, if you've been slack on doing it from the heart, and you're just doing it from your mouth or from your head, if you've been slack because you're not doing it in spirit and truth and you're just going through the motions, then you need to get some things right with God. If there's some things in your life that needs to be fixed, things in your life that needs to be changed, and you're not faithful in your living, then there's some things in your life you need to get right with God. So tonight, once we're saved, Thank God for His salvation. Once we're saved, you and I, there ought to be a difference in our life. Fathers, we come to you again. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to look at a portion of your word. And Father, I pray this evening I said what you'd have me to say. I pray that I said it the right way. And Father, I pray this evening you'll take the message you'll use. And if there's one Listen to all that does not know Jesus as Savior. Father, let them realize that they'll never be able to build that house until they're born into the family of God. Father, there might be one that's listening that's not been faithful to worship, not been faithful to live the way you'd have them to live. Then, Father, I pray you get a hold of that heart and let them see what they need to do and let them see the changes they need to make. Go with us through the rest of this evening. Have your way for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.